Welcome to part two of our conversation with J.R. Stevens. In this episode, we delve deeper into the inspiring journey of J.R. and his perspective on empowering individuals with disabilities. Join us as we continue to explore his experiences, insights, and advocacy efforts in creating inclusive opportunities for all. I think when the expectation is raised and capitalizing and really focusing on a strengths-based approach, with people with disabilities, that becomes the number one benefit is really personal self-worth and feeling that that confidence that you have a place, that you are welcomed, that supported employment opportunity really highlights the importance of those things. Yeah, no, and I'll give you just kind of not to fast forward a bit, but one of the individuals that's been a lifelong friend and I consider him a brother, um, I'll, we'll call him Mike, um, is a gentleman with Williams, a disability. It's a very interesting, challenging, but uh, I had begun tutoring Mike back in high school. Mm. And I, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to work with folks with Williams, but one of the great okay. attributes about them is their social skills are off the chart. In some ways, they're more developed and have greater aptitude than we do. I'll give an example. Uh, my friend Mike, anytime he hears a song once, he will immediately remember all the lyrics, who that artist was, whether it's something he was passionate about or not, and never forget it. That's he almost awesome. Has amazing skills yes. that way. And also a big room of strangers and in comes the cocktail party personality. Mike would immediately will have engaged 50 people in the room and already have a bunch of new friends. I love it. And I want to hang out with Mike. <laughs> Mike is the best. And so I watched him originally and I didn't. I didn't capture his life story in my dissertation because it was more personal. And that was just kind of Mike and I, we, we have our own history together and we're great friends. And I wanted to kind of keep my research outside of him, but take what I learned to see how I could help benefit him. But anyway, he was, I guess, the first example I saw someone that clearly would have better been better suited with a more individual customized curriculum starting in elementary school, junior high right. or high school. Yeah. Much higher aptitude. Somebody that could go into trades right away, that's a hard worker, that's very dedicated, never misses a day of work. And, but oftentimes if they were paired in a group with folks farther, more in the more complex on the spectrum with not as much capability as he, as I would say, the tide would rise or lower depending on who he was around right. at what time. And I, I saw Mike needs more. He can't be stuck here forever with a real low bar for expectation. Right. Because you mentioned a moment ago, if you don't challenge them, then they'll still stay right at whatever that minimum standard is that you're giving them, or they may regress. And I saw that too. Right. Right when we graduated high school, Mike went to a academy down in Arizona that was kind of a transitional experimental um, program where it was basically folks with the various developmental disabilities would, would live together in a, in a home without supervision per se, other more similar like a college dorm room, okay. I would say. Okay. And generally higher on spectrum, but not necessarily the case. But they clearly did not need you know hour to hour to minute physical attention and support to do what they were doing. But anyway, it was it was not a good experience for Mike. And mm. I think in the in his circumstance, just being far away and isolated from his family and good friends was hard for him individually. I'm not by any means judging the program. It might have been a great thing, but he clearly figured out early on, I want to come back. Okay. I want to be near my family and my friends. Right. And I just want to get the job and work hard and and have fun and do whatever. So I've, I've watched Mike over the years in various supported employment opportunities. He worked at Microsoft for many years in the cafeteria. He worked for a bunch of other small startups, generally doing cleanup and sometimes landscaping and just tremendous. I mean, clearly happiest when at work more than anything else. Wow. But the challenge was all of these programs, and I, I did not have access to all the details and the agreements and the duration and what the requirements of these supported employment ops were, but they were always intermittent, never more than like a year. And then Mike was unemployed or in transition and struggling to move to the next opportunity. And, and it was very, has been very hard on him because he's very dedicated, could never understand why suddenly his job that was a great thing yeah. was there one day and then gone the next. And that's always troubled me. So I've kind of monitored that and been a big advocate in his life along with his family and provided coaching and, and whatnot. But he is a classic example of someone that can truly benefit from this. But 
I guess the learnings for me is how do we make these opportunities more uh, long term? Right. Where they literally work up the ladder like any other functioning person instead of them being little interludes that have an end date. Because I think change is very disruptive. Oh, incredibly difficult for many people. Right. Especially my friend, Mike. And it, it's very troubling every time he's told, well, this project's going to end soon. And I know there are advocates and agencies that work with his family to help bridge him to the next one. But, you know, he's currently now working at a Fred Meyer and loving it. And he's fully in charge of all of the shopping cart retrieval out, okay. which we all benefit from. Yeah. But. I go back to his whole capability. I mean, he will do anything you ask him to, and he will work very hard to the best of his ability. But I also think given his innate nature with that cocktail personality that he should be in customer service. If right. You me. Right. And his skill set is in that area. You know, that's where he shines. And so let's tailor the employment to those things that are his best skill. That's exactly skill. right. And we right. all see how even with, um, you know, young people, there's still opportunity in the system for better career mapping early on. You know, I think a lot of kids just go to college to go to college without knowing what they want. It's very expensive. They rack up a bunch of de debt. They don't necessarily learn any job skills and they spend many years after graduation trying to land. That happens all around us today. <laughs> So I'm like all the time or I'm a big and this is a guy that's never worked in trades other than my son is a commercial plumber and I've watched him develop and he's doing very well. We need to be better about introducing young people to trades. All people, yes, but especially need to do it for people with special needs that are higher functioning on the spectrum because there's I mean, we see all the help wanted signs out there. I mean, everybody needs help now. And I would say and I'm probably going to sound old and cranky here a bit, but. I think <laughs> there are a lot of young folks today, they're quote unquote lazy that don't want, they want to play their Xbox, sit on the couch and, and do that. And whereas I look at my friend, Mike, who happens to be developmentally disabled with Williams disease, but he'd give his you know right arm to have a shot yeah. at some of those jobs. And I think um, despite the pressure and the subsidies from the federal and the state and the local governments for a lot of these corporations to make doors open for these folks and hire them. Um, there's still, we have more opportunity. And I think that's yeah. starts with the skills and the training. If we could create better skills programs for people with develop, developmental disabled and, and get them, you know, skill sets they need to mentally hit the ground running as soon as they get out of high school, um, everybody would benefit across the road because there's a, there, you know, there's a transitional period. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, the program aren't necessarily where they need to be. I gave you my frustrations early with, you know, where they often end. And I think, right. um, you know, much more efficient as a society, not only in, yeah. in, in getting these people to be capable and productive, but allowing them to pay their own way, allowing their families to not have to supervise them and be with them and finance. And then right. um, I think it also, and I validated this in my research when I was in school, it greatly Im improves their, their perception. In the past, I mean, we used to hear all the um, slang terms or, or joking terms that people would use for folks in this space. And that always really hurt me because I, I knew that, you know, how mean that was and how, you know, how brutal that would be for someone to be on the receiving end of that. But I think a lot of that was just ignorance and perception that just because they have some challenges and in, in, in complications are never going to be able to normally function like you or I, but that's not the case. Right. And right. you may not ever be a hundred percent on all levels, but you know what, with the right support and the right programs, maybe they can do it 65 or 70% of the time. And that's a hell of a lot better than being at zero. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have, like you, you're alluding to is just you are saying so clearly and so well is that we have an untapped workforce of great dedicated workers that with the right supports, like you're saying, with the right kind of conditions to, to help them be successful. I know many students and young adults who uh, they will not miss a day. They will be on time to work. And that is where they shine. And it's like, yes, they might need some accommodations. They might need some supports that are outside of the typical, you know, 
it just takes some vision, right? And I, I think, yeah, it's a it's amazing to just get your perspective from somebody who's out in the industry, out doing, you know, product development and and all kinds of different, um, really amazing background that you have in business. But you also have that compassion, that long term friendship and history that stems back all the way to those early days when you're just like, you know, so compassionate as an elementary school student. I, uh, I, I would love to ask you, I know we have to wrap it up kind of quickly here, but um, I wanted to ask you just for a closing question. If you could go back to those early days when you were in elementary school, even just as a, as a young adult getting into your post-secondary, you know, any of those points in time for you, what advice would you give yourself? I know you didn't choose to go into special education, but is there is there anything you would tell your younger self or an, or somebody who's just getting into the field? That's an excellent question. And obviously hindsight's twenty twenty or whatever, but I would say um, I made myself available to do more earlier on. Um, okay. I tried to maximize that, but I also have my schoolwork and my sports and my friends and my social life and everything. Um you know, I would say, did I, did I leverage any and all opportunities to expand what I could give and learn in this space wow. would be yeah. the, the first one. Um, you know, perhaps a little me, well, some regret that I may not have gone into this full time as a career to do it a hundred percent of the time. I mean, I had other callings and other opportunities and, and yeah. needs and, you know, that obviously I'm always thinking that through what might've happened if I, you know, could have I been within the industry, a big voice that could make a change systemically to improve these programs and access to them. Not regret, but more what ifs there, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, I mentioned I was a little concerned that, you know, my experience, although valid and real, were, you know, a long time ago in many cases, other than Mike and some of my other friends I I, can't, I stay in touch with, um, you know, been more directly uh, stayed engaged with the evolution of all these programs. I mean, maybe at some point I'd love to pick your brain about the curriculums and, and how they've changed and where you see opportunities and all that, just for my own interest. Um, right. Been a, you know, and I followed in the media in some cases due to some of the legislative changes. A lot of programs that directly finance and benefit this space have been at risk or pulled back. And I've always done a head scratch like, how could you possibly even think about doing this? You know, for so many reasons. Um, they these right. need this and society so needs this. So, you know, maybe even been, you know, involved with lobbying or something, even at the political level to be a voice for these folks yeah. been behind the scenes. Um, yeah, I think there's opportunities, even as I left this world, you know, with daily interaction as an advocate to going into the business world after I graduated. You know, I think there were some opportunities where I could have talked to the companies I work for knowing where we needed to hire folks. And I knew there were gaps with these skills. Could this community, maybe I had opportunity to be a voice. Well, have you guys thought about this? I mean, certain industries generally have, have been leveraged more than others, but I also think the technology world may be a, um, a late adopter for this, right? Now, my friend I mentioned has worked for various tech organizations in their cafeterias in support roles and all, but I think that could be expanded upon, especially with corporate responsibility standards a lot of companies have today. T-Mobile's very big on giving back. And I think, you know, opportunities where we could bring people like my friend Mike and others that could work in, you know, T-Mobile stores, whether they're doing, you know, merchandise docking or receiving, uh, you know, phones in the back or whatever, um, especially when they have these great um Dan with these cocktail party personalities or whatever, they're, they're primed to be in a sales or social setting. So I right. think that would be my feedback on that. Okay. Well, JR, I think we need more people like you in our society. You have such amazing heart, such great perspectives. And I'm just really grateful to you for bringing your compassion, your relationships, and your view for inclusion of people who live life with disability into community settings. I love, love hearing from you today. Thank you so much for your time and for taking this opportunity to talk with me and with our listeners. And um, we're just really grateful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. I'd love for another opportunity one day soon. And um, this has been a great experience for me as well. And it's such a 
a, a genuine issue that more people need to understand. And there's so much more work to do in society. So thank you. Right. Yeah, well, we do. I know SDES and functional academics, we have some really innovative things coming up that Suzanne Fitzgerald and her team are working on that really will highlight some of the things that you had hoped for, Mike, to really tailor the individualized education planning and programming for young adults in school. So it'd be fun to share that with you at some point because you're really good at all that business and marketing kind of realm. So sounds great. Okay. All right. Well, take care and hopefully we'll talk soon. Great. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. A heartfelt thank you to our generous sponsors, specially designed education services, publishers of the Functional Academics Program. Please take a moment to learn more about the only true comprehensive functional academics program that enables students with moderate to severe disabilities to improve their ability to live independently and show meaningful growth both academically and personally while creating accountability with data-driven, evidence-based results. Visit sdesworks.com to learn more.